Hi, my name is Jen and I am a survivor of childhood abuse. I always kind of felt like the outsider. Never felt like I fit in with the cool kids. We were regular church goers. I started getting involved in church in seventh grade. So I would have been like just turning 12, I believe. He was uh, 38. He had this really charismatic personality, very easygoing. He was always very playful. He was super fun to be around, to hang out with, easy to talk to. You know, we all trusted him. Um, and his kids were right there too. He kind of swept in as that trusting father figure. And my dad worked a lot. I know my dad loved me, but he wasn't really the mushy, let's hug type. <laughs> so as a child, I was really craving that. And this guy was like, mm, ding, ding. <laughs> so that was kind of weird, but him really stepping out and showing me like how much he cared for me. He did start finding finding ways to spend time with me uh, alone in ways that I didn't recognize or see. And he offered to give me a ride home. And my mom said that that was fine because his daughter was there too. Well, if the church is here, I live like five minutes up the road this way. He lives 20 minutes this way. So he took both me and his daughter, took his daughter home first, <laughs> and then had all that time alone with me to take me home. And my friends all thought he was just like this really cool guy, super fun to hang out with. So I didn't think there was anything wrong. Like I would regularly sleep over their house. Again, like I'm friends with his daughter and all of their bedrooms were upstairs. So I would sleep downstairs on the couch. One night I remember I, I woke up and he's like kneeling beside me, facing me, scared the out of me. And he's like, oh, I, I just came down to pray for you. I mean, being naive at that age, I'm just like, oh, that's really sweet. He really cares about me. So he would do that regularly, uh, but then that would turn into, uh, you know, back rubs. And then that would turn into going under the shirt with a back rub kind of thing. So crossing those boundaries. There was another incident sleeping over his house, again, hanging out with his daughter. I went upstairs to get a shower. Well, I came back down and he pulls me aside to tell me and apologize that the curtain had been left open and he saw me naked. I mean, looking at that now, I know that he was just kind of like starting that conversation. I mean, if that happened, honestly, there is absolutely no reason for him to pull aside a 13 year old to tell them that. There was a ski trip where the youth group went. I come down the hill and one of the staff people at this, you know, ski resort comes up to me and says, oh, your, your leader is looking for you. So I take all my ski gear off and I go inside um, and he's sitting at a table by himself. So I, you know, sit down with him and he just wanted to get me alone. And he proceeds to start to tell me about how terrible his marriage is. They're not really having it's hard to go back and think like, what was I really thinking? What was I really feeling? Because now like, I feel so stupid, but I maybe part of me was like, oh, he really trusts me. You know, he really cares. The moment for me, when I absolutely knew that this switch had gone, my friend, again, we were, we were in middle school having fun and she had made these kissing licenses. And then at the bottom it says, whoever reads this has to kiss the owner was at church on a Wednesday night talking with his daughter. And again, we're friends and we're we're laughing about this kissing license. And he comes over and says, you know, well, what are you looking at? So we both, me and his daughter, we hand it to him and he reads it and he hands it back. Then later he pulls me aside and he says, when do I get to cash in on that? And that was the moment for me where I was like, whoa, that was my turning point when I knew things had shifted. We're getting close to youth convention. This would have been Easter weekend, eighth grade. So on the way to convention is when he made his move. And then every time we got out of the van, like he, when we got out, he apologized profusely. And he said, it'll never happen again. That weekend progressed. And every time we got in the van, the activity would happen again. And each time we got out, he would profusely apologize again. Like, but then I think the apologizing just stopped when he realized like, hey, she's not going to tell anybody. We come back from youth convention. I had kind of become infatuated with him and this relationship. And he had convinced me that this was okay. And the Bible didn't apply to us. And he used Celine Dion and her husband and their age gap, because with them, there was a... Um, 26 year age gap. And with us, it was a 28 year age gap. But anyway, so I had this guy telling me, we're gonna get married when you turn 18. He gave me a card that said, you know, he wanted to meet up with me in the woods near my house. He said, I'll bring a blanket and a pillow and something that you may or may not want me to use. He was referring to it, but that's exactly what he wrote in the card. So I went and met him in the woods. 
and you know he had the blanket laid out he had a little clock on a rock so you know what time it was <laughs> and we had that very first day. I was 13, he was, you know, 38, 39. I think when I went down there, he performed oral on me. That was the very first thing he did before we even kissed. The next day that I went to meet him, he was sitting there next to a tree with a backpack and he had a rope on the backpack and he said he was going to hang himself because he was afraid I was going to tell someone. So I reassured him, I'm like, no, no, like I, I wouldn't do that to you kind of thing. So that entire summer, I would spend, you know, meeting him down in the woods. We never did use a And he told me that if I was to get pregnant, he had already done his research and there was an abortion clinic a couple towns over that did not require any ID. So he told me his plan that if I was to get pregnant, he would take me there and pose as my father and get me an abortion. He had a key to the church where he wanted to play this lights out game. <laughs> and he would turn, we were in the basement, it was at night, and we turned the lights out. And it was some kind of hide and seek or whatnot. So we'll, the lights would go out, the teens that were there, you know, playing this game. But while the lights are out, he's kissing me in the church. In the middle of youth group, so there's this room and we're all sitting in chairs, like around the outer part of the room. I'm sitting here, his daughter's on the other side of him. And I go to talk to her, so I like lean over him. So I'm saying something to his daughter. He's like cupping my breast, like right there in the middle of the room. I do remember on one occasion that my parents had this guy over to the house to sit him down and say, like, tell him, you have boundary issues. You need to back away from our daughter. And again, they didn't think there was anything going on. Like this guy was just that good at manipulating and lying. At this point, I still had not told anyone, and we're coming up at the end of the summer of eighth grade. I'm going into ninth grade, so I'm starting high school. I'm kind of losing interest in this relationship. I'm just wanting to be a teenager. I'm, I'm liking boys my own age, so I really just don't want anything to do with him anymore. I was going to take the secret to my grave. I really was. Like, I had no intention of telling anyone, but we're done. No big deal. We're just going to move on. So there was a guy that I liked in the high school there. And, you know, we kind of had been dating. I had written him a note and I, I don't remember what I said, but I must have said just enough that he went home and showed that note to his parents that kind of gave, gave, gave up the story. And I remember it being April 1st because that night my mom comes to me and she's like, did you play any practical jokes on anyone today? And as soon as she said that, I knew so I went inside and my mom and dad were both there. You know, the person that had called was my friend's dad that he had given the note to. So somehow I was able to get out, you know, I've been having And they said, well, who with? And I could not say his name. And one of my parents said his name and I said, yes. My dad proceeded to go downtown to meet with, you know, this, this father that had the note. So meanwhile, when my dad's going there, my mom sits down with me. And <laughs> the very first thing she says to me, um, out of out of so much love and concern, but the very first question she says, do you have any proof? So the very next day, I didn't go to school. I was at the police station instead, you know, and they were interviewing me. When I think back now, like the reason why I want to share my story so badly is because the only questions the police ask are, you know, what lines were crossed? You know, what can we charge him with? I had never really told anyone the story of how that grooming process happened, all the details, all the minor things. I was very comfortable. I knew who the police chief was, you know, was familiar with them. So it wasn't like, who's this scary guy? Um, and my mom was right there next to me. I don't know the details of like, when they went to arrest him or how that all went down. But I do remember my mom telling me that his wife had asked the church for help with bail money. And again, that was really hard for me to process because I wasn't sure like who was at fault here. I felt like I was the one in trouble. I don't know where they got the bail money, but he was out and free. So after the police station, I mean, he had to have been arrested at some point because he needed bail money. I was terrified. He continued to stalk me. There was a preliminary hearing to determine whether or not like it would go to trial, what he would plead. So here I am in this courtroom, very public. And I remember them asking details about where we would meet. And I had to explain to this room of people what was so that they knew that I understood like that we had actually had. And I remember them asking me, did you give him any gifts? 
I was like, I didn't think so. If I think back now, like, sure, like I made like friendship bracelets or things like that. But I remember that so clearly because as I'm trying to think, I look over and his wife is nodding yes. I knew that she was only getting the side of the story or the version that he was giving her. Anyway, so he was sentenced to five to ten years in prison. That was a relief. And then as far as I was concerned, things were were done. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Obviously, you know, my mom tried to take me to counseling. I didn't have anything to say to them. I have nothing but love for his family. You know, his wife and his kids, they didn't ask for this. His kids are very sweet. I, I do remember after this had all come out, his wife and daughter had come to our house. I don't know what the adults talked about, like his wife and my mom, but his daughter came into my room and I remember we were sitting on the bed and she opened up her Bible. Uh, and I, I remember her sharing scripture with me and, you know, it was a very gracious, loving kind of thing. She had to process this same traumatic thing. I had been in contact with her, you know, kind of like in recent years. And she is actually working with traffic victims. So she just, she has a huge heart. I, I, I do love her and appreciate her very much. So she can kind of see both sides. Like she can love her father as a father but still understand. But in more recent years, you know, he's out of prison now and was serving at a, uh, a local church back in that town. And my sister still lives in that town, so we know people. And one of the people in the church noticed that he was on the Megan's Law Defender Registry and asked him about it. And his response was like, oh, that was just a misunderstanding with a 17 year old. That's not okay. Not okay in the least. In my eyes, I really just think he's using this as like, hey, I went to prison. Look what God can do with me. Like he's just adding that to his resume because he's not truly sharing like his story of what had happened. So like two years have gone by and I was watching like a daytime talk show, like, like the Sally Jesse Raphael or whatever it was back in the 90s. And they were talking about grooming and my jaw hit the floor. I'd never heard of it word for word what had happened to me like what he had done to me and I just couldn't comprehend like when you look at stories of and grooming like I don't know if they all read like the same training manual or something but they're all so similar like all the stories are different but they're the same I did not process any of that properly because I just didn't know how and so carried that trauma with me and for years just struggled with anxiety depression I had a 20-year addiction and any addiction whatever it be food it's an escape from reality. So that had become my coping mechanism. I've been free several years now and it's just not even not even an issue and after 20 years. So those faulty core values that I had gained from that trauma is like, I am a bad person. I'm not worthy of protection. I have no value. And I just, my brain, I would go through life like acting like I need to do something to get love. So I love the phrase, it's become like my motto, live loved. Like I am loved, I just am. I mean, if you find yourself coming out of this situation, just know like you were loved. It was not your fault at all. Your brain is not fully developed. That's why they prey um, on, on children because they know they can manipulate. Don't believe the lie that you're fine. You're not fine. <laughs> I wasn't fine. Find a counselor. Like I went to counseling and it didn't help. Like you gotta find a counselor that um, specializes in trauma. I like to share my story again because these headlines aren't going away anytime soon. Like they're increasing and it's so sad. And the best way to combat something is to bring it into the light, to expose it, uh, to share like what to watch for. My heart goes out to the parents when I read those headlines. You know, when you see these the headlines shared on social media, all the comments are of course like uh, against the perpetrator but my heart is directly like just going out to the victim and the parents who have to now navigate this. It's so freeing when you find someone else that has gone through the same thing. Um, and by sharing your story, you're giving someone else permission to share the, theirs. Like they don't have to be the first one. My advice for someone that has gone through this, take a deep breath, <laughs> tell someone, find a trusted person. And the second that you share that shame, that embarrassment, it loses its power. Again, my name is Jen. Thank you so, so much uh, for spending some time here with me to hear my story. Um, if you're finding yourself in a similar situation, you are not alone. You are loved. You are worthy. And we are all here for you. Live loved.